Welcome to The Spawn Chunks, episode number 210 for Monday, September 12th, 2022. My name is Joel Duggan and joining me as always is my friend Johnny, but you may know him better as Pixel Riffs. Hello, sir. Hello, we've had a transformative discussion in a number of ways in The Render Distance this week. You can listen to The Render Distance if you're a patron of the show. You can get an extended conversation a little bit longer at the beginning and end of every episode if you join us at patreon.com slash the spawn chunks. Joel's been talking about his Optimus Prime Transformers set. I've been talking about the transformative power of men's tennis and, uh, and occasional trips to the garden center as well. All that and more in the pre-show this week and the post-show who knows because this is our chunk mail dispenser episode in which we dedicate the episode to your emails and there's always little bits of discussion that tend to trickle into the uh the post-show episode as well um so this week we have a bunch of listener email next week we're going to have another guest episode for you because archaeo plays will be joining us to talk about how minecraft can be used for archaeology outreach what we can learn about the minecraft world if we dig a little deeper and to share their perspective on what minecraft's shelved archaeology system could potentially bring to the game uh, so really excited to talk to them uh, i spent a great time building Petra a little while ago with Archaeoplays and talking at an archaeology gaming conference about what Minecraft can be used for and the history of the Minecraft world itself. So a lot of fun discussions going to happen next week and uh, in the spirit of this being the Chunk Mail episode, if you have any emails that you'd like to send in, any kind of archaeology perspectives on Minecraft that you're maybe curious about or have opinions of your own about, then please do send them our way. The email address will be coming up later in the episode and we'd love to hear from you. So what have you been up to this week in Minecraft, my friend? Well, this week I've not had a whole lot to show for yet because I've been doing some more sneaky lore-based builds on the Empire's SMP. I'm still kind of working on what the concept for my next survival guide episode is going to be, but in the meantime, I'm trying to fill in a few people's backstories or try and build some stuff for people to find that's going to be relevant to the characters that they're playing on the server. And so one of those is happening right now. I'm not sure that the recipient of this build has found everything about it yet, so I'm not going to disclose too much information. But in the meantime, I'm planning a large road that go that goes from the, the gatehouse, which I've shared previously on the show, the gatehouse that's on the Great Bridge, and there's a road that leads back from that towards my empire. But I have discovered that I have some habits I need to break when it comes to city building. And a lot of this has actually been inspired by watching you build West Hill, but is also just oh, me cool. reacting to the terrain around me, is that survival builds are often built with players in mind and players don't mind staircases being everywhere. But when you're trying to build a road that feels like it needs to be the point at which traffic comes into a city, and that's not just people on foot, but that's horses, that's, you know, hay carts, that's goods vehicles, merchants, you know, royal processions, if you like, that kind of stuff. Like, the the the, the typical path that you build around your Minecraft base doesn't make any sense for that more often than not because you have hills that are like 45 degree angles that mm -hmm. you go up and you can't imagine like even people living in san francisco don't have to deal with that kind of road so i've been working on having a kind of winding road that starts as a straight road a kind of main thoroughfare into the capital but then takes a left and curves back around the outside of terrain and i wish i had some screenshots to share of this but it's still in the very early stages i'm more or less working on the shape of it and then adding in the detail and stuff later but it's a really neat feature because it also starts to divide up the space a little bit and it's a raised road so the landscape drops off after this hill that the the gatehouse is kind of resting up against and behind the hill in a valley in the savannah maybe 12 blocks of height difference but it's it's a lot um i that's where i'm building the majority of the buildings of my capital so i had to connect those roads in a way that felt organic and natural and it kind of sweeps around and curves around but it means a lot of it is elevated from the terrain around it until it reaches the point in the slope where it can touch down at a sensible incline and that means on the opposite side of that you can have buildings and you know the main area of the city but then i could build a tunnel underneath the road and that can lead out to something that feels like it's outside of a city wall almost and so i've started a farming district there 
where a nice. lot of farms would typically be placed outside of medieval city walls because people aren't going to be like raising crops in there and there's no room for expansion and stuff to grow naturally and you'd probably also want to have livestock and stuff raised outside of the city so that they don't contribute to the smell and waste and everything right mm -hmm. um and so yeah you can you can start to develop an idea of city infrastructure that way and while a lot of this is going to have fallen into disuse and disrepair and some of it is going to have been growing wild i like the idea of it feeling more structured so that's where i'm at in my empire's build right now and i'm trying to figure out a way that i can turn that into a larger essay on infrastructure around the the empire's stuff but in the meantime i'm still finding excuses to do little cheeky redstone builds and experiences for people to explore that have a bit more character road projects are a lot of fun because while there is a lot of work and a lot of planning it's also kind of i don't want to say repetitive but it's just nice to have this one singular task for a while you know yeah because they're they're big they tend to take a long time depending on how wide you make them and what kind of obstacles you have to deal with it's interesting that it's a raised road because i usually end up having the opposite problem like i usually end up thinking like for the same reason that you mentioned 45 degrees it's too steep like it goes up too fast i need to like remove this hill or cut the road through it or something in order to reduce it to like slab level incline so that if you are going to go up a little bit you're going to go up like one slab and then five blocks forward and then another half block mm -hmm. and then five blocks forward but that ends up like flattening earth rather than being raised above it and so i i don't often have an opportunity to have a road that's up high uh, at least not where i am in, in west hill but i know what you mean about dividing things up and i find that even just like a path that leads up to a farm or like a in modern days we would call it like a driveway um but that kind of stuff will also start dividing up the plots naturally mm -hmm. You know, yeah. because you you want to put the road, you're not going to put the road right up the hill. You're going to put the road between the hills. And that immediately means that like, well, one hill is probably one person's property and the other hill is probably another kind of person's property. And that gets the wheel spinning as the what you can fill that space in with. You know, like whenever we get email or I get questions on, on live streams about like, how do you come up with the ideas for what you're building? The road stuff is really important because it kind of paints yourself into a corner, so to speak and and you're left with naturally divided terrain where you're like okay well i was gonna put this thing here but now that i've got the road here which is more important this space is too small for the mm. castle or or the barn or whatever it is that i was going to put here there's not enough room for a field this doesn't make any sense i'll have to put the field somewhere else and then you have to come up with well what could i put here you know and that spurs on a different thought process and new ideas right yeah, yeah. And as always, I'm inspired at all times in this project by the dynamic environments that you find in Elden Ring. And mm -hmm. a lot of that, you're entering a city at a much higher vantage point so you can see out over all the rooftops and sometimes even access some of the rooftops to jump around and find secrets from there and that kind of thing. But then the actual ground level the road level of the city is much further down than your initial entry point and so the challenge then becomes how do i get down there without dying of fall damage <laughs> which mm. is less of a problem in minecraft like even once once you have feather falling and protection enchantments you can survive a pretty hefty drop without just straight up dying so i'm not necessarily designing it with that in mind and making it a parkour challenge necessarily but i'm thinking if my road is still raised then I can build some buildings down there and you could leap from the side of the road onto a nearby roof and then do a bit of hopping around and finding different ways to explore the space. And the the interesting thing there is I'm not sure what my eventual route around the place is going to be because I typically find that whenever I build infrastructure, it's for show and it's never the stuff that I use. People used to call me out all the time for walking along the the parapet of a bridge that I had built in my survival guide world instead of walking down the middle to get from one place to another and that was because <laughs> more often than not i could just jump from the side of it activate my wings and then i'd be in the air and it would you know provide a, an, an easy yeah. takeoff point but i also yeah for whatever reason i i always felt like walking along the the tops of the walls and whenever there's roads in my town i'm always taking the shortcuts through the gardens and that kind of thing so i'm, I'm curious to see how it will affect my own exploration of the space and how it affects visitors exploration as well i make a conscious effort to try to walk around west hill uh, as often as i can because i'm always going back to the shed to get parts and blocks yeah. and things and i'm always going back and forth and i try not to not to fly around too much that's not been true of the taiga mansion but that's because i keep on having to fly up to the roof and you just get sick of climbing up 
40 <laughs> blocks of scaffolding yeah. time and time again right so how is the uh, how's the roof going <laughs> uh good i well i mean i I don't want to say i've given up but i've certainly made some some changes that i feel are for the better it's not as flashy and does not provide any kind of interesting space on the inside of the roof i just added some buttresses Mm -hmm. i took that design from the south side that that we you know you gave me the nice compliment on a couple weeks ago where it's the, the one dormer with several windows in it yeah and and we use blast furnaces and and uh andesite walls to kind of decorate that so I thought, all right, well, how do how do you get through? Instead of coming up with something new, you've already established something that you like. Use the blast furnaces, use the andesite walls. What can you build with that? Well, you could build buttresses with that. And this is a big roof. It looks like it could probably need some support. And so, um, and there's something about that gothic look for for any kind of buttress that has, I think probably through pop culture, it just kind of has that kind of like aggressive kind of feel. It's mm. spiky or thin or uh, it looks like ribs. Like it just, it has, I think part of it is because of like, you know, any kind of like Dracula castle or anything you've seen in a, in a, in a kid's cartoon is generally that kind of spooky type design. Yeah. Um, and so it kind of, it lends a little bit of, of not sinister quality, but it just has a little bit of like a, uh, an off, um, beat, I guess nature to it so i did that and i also um totally stealing this idea i think from mythical sausage but i need to get better at using m- chunkier blocks in my roofs in order to add detail uh yeah. it feels weird when you're up close but when you're on the ground it looks great uh so i put a series of anvils and trap doors across the ridge of the roof and all it does is just it just looks like wrought iron work from a distance uh mm-hmm. and i use the anvils because of course they're the right color for iron in a medieval town whereas the iron bars are currently quite shiny you yeah. know uh and so I, I did that i'm happy with that and i mean that was one stream of kind of going up and down a lot and, and messing around um I, during that stream i also took some time inside and changed the slabs and stairs that i had in the main hall into the proper tables and chairs from the tables and chairs data pack um haven't done any textures in the floor but i did add a fireplace detail so i've got like a hanging cauldron and a couple of um campfires with logs and some mini blocks like i've got like a from the wandering trader data pack i've got the mini block for basalt looks like a bit of like ashen wood kind of in the fireplace so stuff like that was really really fun to do um and then on the second day again feeling not so much frustrated but kind of not sure where to go with the interior and and where to go next on the outside of the build and in part being very tired of going up and down constantly from the previous stream i decided that one of the things that was bugging me because every time I go back and forth to my main storage, I have to walk through the front gate uh, to get up to the building. And the front gate was completely not decorated. It was just like a placeholder wall and it felt a little bit too close to the road. So I went through and I decorated the entire street front where the entrance to this mansion happens to be. I used an anvil to kind of try to tie the designs together. I used some blast furnaces. It's kind of a spiky gate again to kind of make it feel important and maybe a little bit scary. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I just did, you know, um, lovely to work with things like mangrove uh, leaf blocks because they change their temperature color uh, in the taiga biome that I'm in. So where azalea stand out dramatically, these kind of blend right in with the spruce, but they're a different texture. So they look like they're a different thing than spruce. And I already had an established kind of like um fence not fence gate um trapdoor and sign combination to kind of make a fence along the uh, along the border of the street so that was all working really well some custom trees very organic gameplay on sunday versus saturday and it was what i needed i think to shake the sillies out from like constantly bashing my head against how i'm going to fix this roof and how i'm going to fix this structure um and my favorite thing which is something that i'm i'm quite proud of that I've not seen. I'm sure somebody else has come up with it, but I have not seen it anywhere else. But I used a combination of mud, muddy mangrove roots, and the way that I placed the mangrove leaf blocks to create like a thorn bush, like thicket sort of deal. Uh Because I didn't want the wall to go all the way around. The wall connects to the tower, but it doesn't go all the way around the property. I needed some sort of like, this is just impassable. So I'd have to use the front gate. And I've got some fence gates in there. They're difficult to see in the screenshots because of the way that the shaders do. But I also like because of the way that I placed the leaves, I've got like a lot of holes. So it looks like a dark thicket. And then I've placed the fence gates open in a couple of those holes. And they just 
sort of pass as branches when you see them in the, the corner of your eye when you walk mm -hmm. by. But then behind everything, you've got like the brown and the directionality of the muddy mangrove roots, which you could use to your advantage. And that is behind all of the uh, mangrove leaf blocks. So in some points, they're creating a nice solid backdrop so that the, the leaf blocks don't look transparent. Uh, but then also there's places where I just don't have a leaf block and you can see the roots. And so it just looks like, you know, if you ever look through a hedge and the hedge has got leaves on the outside, but inside there's just nothing but like branches everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. And it just has that kind of like crisscross. There's no way through this unless you're a squirrel sort of deal. Yeah. And I'm really happy with the way that it turned out. I, I didn't even have to make new trees. The trees were there. I just moved the trunks a little bit. Like I kind of like there'd be a tree and it's like, this is in my way, but I don't want to cut it down. So I just kind of like twisted the trunk, gave it a custom trunk and left the natural Minecraft tree where it spawned. So that mm -hmm. kind of stuff I always find really fun and really satisfying when you can use the Minecraft terrain, but you don't feel like you're just clear cutting and starting again. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm finding that with the road that I'm building where there's a couple of trees that don't get in the way of the road but naturally grow up against it. And I'm probably going to modify a couple of them, but I just think, oh yeah, no, a tree would have just grown here and, you know, they would have to... You, they wouldn't have to worry about moving it or anything if it wasn't getting in the way to begin with and it just helps the whole thing feel more natural and if you can modify those trees a little bit just to make them feel a bit more varied than your standard minecraft tree that's fairly symmetrical looking then yeah that's that's ideal really i do like the fact that you've repeated the motif from the roof for the gate as well that kind of ties everything together really nicely Thanks, and yeah and I like the rose bushes on the way up. That's another thing that, like, the kind of gothic Dracula castle kind of thing. You've got some blood red roses outside. It feels uh, like the whole thing kind of suits itself. The the My first thought when you said, like, a bramble thicket kind of thing was putting sweet berry bushes in there as well. But I can imagine if those are anywhere that you'd be walking, they're just going to be more of an inconvenience than anything else, right? Well, so, the, and the thing with the, the, the berry bushes is that I do have them. They're along the road and they, they, in this particular build, they look more decorative and they're quite bright. Yeah. And in the bramble, like, I feel like they would just be distracting. Yeah, um, sure. Even the, even the green grass, it's not so bad in the, um, the shot, the screenshots with the shaders, but in regular, just Minecraft with other shaders on the, the green grass along the road is even a much different color than the mangrove trees so yeah, like i might yeah. i might have to change it to a fern or something that's a little bit more taiga um but yeah the, thanks the the rose bushes there is actually a lot more and there's a it's a combination of rose bushes and um berry bushes going mm -hmm. up the right hand side uh, and there's more trees and more um more vines inside but it kind of helps with that whole like overgrown it feels very solid and very intentional now but to go back to what you're saying about your road there's another thing you can do too if the tree is there, you could also think, okay, well, maybe the tree wasn't here when they built the road. So like if you have a tree that grows up really close to the road, you could also warp the road as if yeah. the tree roots have like pushed the road out of the way over the last hundred years or however mm -hmm. long your road is supposed to be there. Just because I know that you're putting in like the lore, like the history of, yeah. of empires. Um, that's how like that's going to be. That's going to be a lot of fun to have that kind of, um, I guess, play in when things were made like a lot of times in me like for me i'm kind of like yes everything in west hill has been built at different times but it's so roughly the same sort of timeline whereas yeah. you've got in your lore of, of empires you've kind of got like how like however long the time range wants to be is it thousands is it millions you don't know and or we don't know but you do and i think that that would be a real thing to play with in terms of like well here's something that was built ages and ages ago by a civilization that does not exist anymore and then like here's something else that's been built recently on top of or near something that was really old and having that just a position is really cool yeah one of the things i want to do with this road is have sections of it because it's raised up have sections that have kind of crumbled away a little mm -hmm. bit and maybe have like a cart that's been on its way along the road and has just kind of half fallen off the road and has got stuck kind of like like it's teetering <laughs> on the edge but not like an overturned cart but a cart that has just kind of like two of the wheels have fallen off the side of the road maybe some of the the masonry and supports have crumbled underneath it yeah. so I, I'm, I'm gonna try and work in details like that but it's always difficult working at the scale that i'm working at so we'll see but uh, lo lots to do still and the the picture is slowly falling into place 
Moving into the news this week, Minecraft Live 2022 has been announced. There's an article on Minecraft.net. We already knew this, but uh, the official announcement is out there, as well as the announcement trailer, which I hope you have all watched. As we previously heard in August, the uh, in the edition of Minecraft Now, this year's Minecraft Live show will be broadcast on October 15th at noon Eastern time. We have a time now. That's 5 p.m. in the UK. There will be a mob vote, although mob voting will happen in three places this time around, on a dedicated Bedrock Edition server, through the Java Edition launcher, and at Minecraft.net. The mob vote will also take place 24 hours ahead of the event. Your vote will be changed if you change your mind and the results will not be revealed until the live event itself on a completely different note minecraft has just released two new board games i found out about this via mark watson mark underscore irl on twitter uh the first is portal dash in which players traverse a dangerous board together in a quick but tactical attempt to escape the nether and Heroes of the Village, also a cooperative game where you and your pet pals defend a village against an oncoming raid. Uh, Portal Dash, he explained, was intended for players 12 and up, while Heroes of the Village skews a little younger for 7 and up, but both kind of games that the, the family can get into. And both are available now. Um, it was a pretty short announcement just saying, right, these are out there. Um, you'll find them at most games retailers where you'll also find Minecraft's debut board game, Builders and Biomes. So I haven't had a chance to get hold of either of these yet i don't have as much time to play board games these days but i'm kind of curious about them and i'm pretty excited that minecraft is making further strides in the uh, the board game market as well i they look fun you know like uh, the art from minecraft is very kid friendly i think any, anytime that parents that maybe don't really get minecraft or don't have time to play minecraft with their kids can do something like this where the kids are not in front of a screen you're not in front of a screen you're not in front of your phone like you can play and get to know the world that the kids would probably know so well but then have like a family event like i think this is great you know i, I think it's um it's accessible right compared to because mm -hmm. i know lots of people that you know probably have the time but just they're, they're just not video game parents like it's something that their kids do you know and they just they just don't get it you know uh I, my mom uh, always thought what we did was neat, but she couldn't play video games to save her life. She was, <laughs> she'd be the person that would be like yanking the controller around the room, you know, like yeah, just yeah. that kind of stuff, trying to steer the Mario Kart, like that, that kind of stuff. It just wasn't her thing. You know, um, my dad, my dad actually gets motion sick when he plays video games. Like he right, can't play yeah. racing. He can't play racing games because he's just like, okay, that's, that's enough of that. <laughs> you know, he mm -hmm. gets, he gets the spins. Uh, and, um, which is funny because my parent, we never really went to, um, amusement parks much as kids i went as a teenager but as kids we didn't go very much because neither one of my parents could take the rides mm -hmm. they can't do it they get they get motion sick what do you think of the uh trailer for uh for minecraft live i really liked it uh it's really subtle and on I, on one hand it's it's more of a like a teaser trailer announcement thing it's just it's it it's a lot of fun. I feel like I've seen similar memes in pop culture over the last year, just like head bopping to music and just kind of mm -hmm. like no words, no one's saying anything, but there's this underlying, if you understand the joke, then you'll get, you'll get the, the, the trend. And it's not like there's any real poignant message. It's more like, no, no, this is just a thing that people are doing. People find it funny. So the more people that do it, the funnier it is. And I like the idea of all the different mobs coming together with music as a as a kind of a, a tie-in and to me it spoke a lot about legends which i'm assuming we're going to learn a lot more about at minecraft live and as cute as the animation is and as, as fun as the the trailer is i do find that it is very difficult as a minecraft main player to now discern any kind of easter eggs or hints that they're throwing at you in these trailers because there's three games now right mm -hmm. you've got minecraft yeah. you've got minecraft dungeons and you've got minecraft legends and all the mobs coming together that's a minecraft legends thing right like that's what yeah. makes you think of like that's what you do in that game you as the hero rally all the overworld mobs to defend against the piglins um i didn't really get a lot of minecraft dungeons vibes from it and i certainly was like well maybe maybe the minecarts are hinting at minecraft like prime i'm not sure what to call minecraft to, to to differentiate it now but like it's it's got that kind of not confusing message because it's not confusing it was just like as as 
people that are used to hunting for Easter eggs specifically for Minecraft, we now are like, well, wait a minute, this could be completely not for Minecraft at all. And I think it does kind of point to uh, managing player expectations again, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's most of it I'm assuming is Minecraft unless it's obviously otherwise is <laughs> yeah. the kind of thing where like obviously the piglins that you see a bit later on and some of the creeper and skeleton designs, you see them go past and you think, oh, OK, those are the ones from Legends because the art style feels very different. But um, yeah, I, I love this video. I thought it was really good. The um, the whole thing achieves a lot with just animation set to music and no voiceover. Like it's still mm -hmm. kind of a catchy beat and the animation is very funny. There were a couple of Easter eggs in there. I spotted like the frog eats a goat at one point, and that's obviously a reference <laughs> to the glitch that came up in development of the frogs. And yeah. there was also an it snapshot day my dudes sign in one of the backgrounds, which is what the devs typically like tweet about on on Twitter on Wednesdays when the snapshot cycle is happening. So yeah, th there's a few kind of if you if you know you know kind of jokes in there, but for the most part, it's just good clean fun. Um, I, I thought I thought some of the text flashed on screen for a very short period of time, so I had to like blink a couple of times to make sure I'd taken in that the date was announced and what was happening with the mob vote and stuff like that. But of course, that's all detailed for you on the Minecraft.net article if you're at all confused by the trailer. And I think the main takeaway from it and from the announcement is that they they have a new approach to the mob vote, and I think it's a good move. It's just one vote. Uh, so it, it says that, you know, if you have up to 24 hours to vote ahead of time, then presumably whatever options they give you, I'm guessing three options again, it's not going to be an elimination of the first one and then the remaining votes are split between the other two. It's just going to be one vote and whoever wins, wins. Mm -hmm. um, so that you don't have to be super reactive to it on the day and you can concentrate on just hanging out and watching the show. They also don't have a Twitter requirement this year, and people were saying in previous years it did feel kind of strange not to host it in a place that was accessible to people you knew were Minecraft players instead of just people who had the biggest bandwagon they could throw at it on Twitter. Yeah. And the fact that it's accessible from a Bedrock Edition server or from the Java Edition launcher means that it feels like they're prioritizing people who are actually Minecraft players as opposed to just the general public. Not that I think the general public took much of an interest in a Minecraft mob vote, but you never know. And I think the fact that the tw the winner isn't going to be revealed until all of the votes have been counted and stuff, like that's, that's really good. And all the mobs have to do now is just sound like they'd be a good choice for the game, which we still don't know anything about, but I expect that'll be the, the week leading up to Minecraft Live itself. I agree with the change. I think that's it's good. It's more accessible to, to people. Uh, I think that, again, you know, having it be part of the install base literally is is a good a good thing to start off. It's still on Minecraft.net. I honestly, I kind of feel like knowing the launcher, like I kind of feel like I might vote through Minecraft.net just because it's probably going to be the easiest way. <laughs> sure. And you yeah. still have you can still you still have to log in, right? Like you still have to use your Minecraft handle to log in. I would assume so. You can, yeah. you can browse the site without, but I don't know where they're going to be hosting the vote on the page. Yes. So we'll see. But either way, yeah, yeah like they, they have a, a slightly better way of confirming that actual Minecraft players are voting for this actual Minecraft feature. Because you can't, I don't think you can do anything with the launcher until you log in. It's just a login screen until you to you actually log in you can't launch the games unless you've logged yeah. in i don't think yeah yeah you can um, play it you can play a demo on the java version i think but yeah that's, oh, that's yeah. more or less it yeah uh i i like the idea that you're going to be able to change your mind uh because you know as you can vote and they release more information usually there's a good idea of what the mobs are but you don't really get the final information until you've got someone you know like agnes or, or someone else on stage talking about it. And you get little tidbits that aren't in the little minute long videos that you yeah. tend to get, um, which I'm looking forward to. I really like those little animated Agnes and Yen's videos. They may not be <laughs> as informative as they could be, but my gosh, they're charming. And yeah, I, really, yeah. I really like those. And uh, I think that the, the biggest takeaway is the uh, hidden results until the end mm -hmm. that means that you know i'm glad you mentioned bandwagon it means that if you just see that the one mob that is most popular is running away with it then you might be inclined to just vote for that to make sure it gets in or what there's no point in voting for the moo bloom that i'm throwing under the bus right now because it's only got 10 percent, and you see it's only got 10 percent. so why would you bother yeah, but yeah. now you're not going to know you're just going to vote for the the mob that you want in the game 
and then the results are secret until revealed. And I think that's smart. I think that that removes a lot of the trend, you know, that you see around these kind of things. Yeah. Also, from the perspective of what we did last year, restreaming the the Minecraft live event as we went, when we were doing that, we could also watch the poll results on Twitter and effectively announce which one had been voted in before the the team on yes. stream were able to because they were in the yeah. middle of another segment right so yeah. like i i think it's it's kind of it keeps some of the suspense it makes him opening the envelope at the end of the stream and saying it's going to be this mob a little bit more exciting because anybody who's participated in the poll can go back to twitter and see the results the way they did it previously so yeah, yeah i i think it, it it really ties the whole thing into minecraft live as an event and means that we're going to be tuned into the stream watching and waiting with bated breath instead of just like logging into twitter and remembering oh yeah no it's already been it's already been done <laughs> at that point with some of the goofy stuff that you see in the trailer do you think that minecraft could use like a little bit more goofy like that you know like we've got skeletons and zombies we've got you know pillagers and and things but like the the fact that these guys are all kind of like bopping to music like do you think that minecraft could have a little bit more whimsy in it I mean, maybe, yeah. Like we we talked about the animation style of stuff and 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 changing up animations of different mobs in previous episodes, and I think there's there's something to that. I've seen a few people kind of getting tired of the way a lot of Minecraft animation feels right now, but I think it's it, it's because the game has so many different ways you can play it. There are so many different styles you can build in, or you know, you can project your own ideas onto minecraft in such a way that making it more whimsical maybe detracts from the experience of players who want to take it more seriously right. so it, it's a difficult line to walk and and with this being such a huge game with such a variety of approaches these days i i i don't know it's it's difficult to say for sure um but people have been sending in ideas to our chunk mail inbox and you know stuff like this comes up so i think we should maybe dive right into chunk mail right now Sounds like a plan. If you'd like to email the show, and like I said at the top of the show, we're going to have Archeo plays on next week, so any archaeology-themed Minecraft questions, feel free to send them to spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. And if you have any other questions that you want read up on the show, if you want us to have a discussion about stuff, keep them short and sweet, and we have a whole bunch of them to read today. The first one comes in from Kokorodaki, who is a landscape artist member of our Discord community, and the subject is Key Golems. After the recent episode talking about ideas for a Minecraft Live mob vote, including the discussion of pulling mobs from the other Minecraft games, I keep thinking about Minecraft Dungeons mobs that I think might work well in regular Minecraft, and I keep coming back to the Key Golem. I'm not sure why I think it'd work well in Minecraft, and I don't even have any ideas for what it could do, but in my mind it just fits really well. What do you guys think of Key Golems in Minecraft? How do you think they could be adapted to fit, and do you have any ideas on what they could do? Kokorodaki died of starvation trying to get the key golem to fit in the darn hole, but it kept running away. I I agree. I think key golems definitely fit, especially now that a laser in the game. And if I recall, key golems have sort of a chime or song to their sounds that they make. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? They, they, kind of... they, they have a tendency to fall asleep. And so I always imagine their noises to just be kind of like kind of squeaky snoring as though yeah. like a, a a particularly small puppy has fallen asleep and they just mm -hmm. have this like that's kind of noise is, to them. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's what I get from it. I don't know if that's the intention, but they, they do tend to, they, they walk off and fall asleep as their like default thing. Yeah. I could be remembering the noise of like the in-game noise letting you know you've picked up the key column where it has like a chime or some sort of like good thing you have picked it up this is a good thing to do yeah yeah that sort of confirmation noise but uh but yeah i mean I, I think they're cute um i don't know what you would be able to use them for because here's the thing in minecraft dungeons they're used to unlock doors outside of bedrock there's no real barriers in minecraft like you can't you locking a door and if you're rping sure but like really you can just break your way through the wall so I don't know about that. I could imagine them being used to unlock specific loot chests, maybe. Um, but again, we don't have important enough loot in the game that would warrant the work to wrangle a key golem uh, and then have it be important enough for you to use it to unlock a, a reward chest or a loot chest. So I, it's like, I don't know. Um, but I just, I, I do like the idea of them. And I think that comes back to what I was saying about a little bit more quirkiness, a little bit more whimsy. Um, something I really liked about last year's mob vote was 
that nothing was just another animal, you know, mm -hmm. that was already in the game. And I think that something like a key golem, it's just uniquely Minecraft. And I think that that's why it has that appeal for both games. Um, but yeah, was, what, what do you think? Like, what do you think a key golem could be used for in, in Minecraft? I think they would be great for an update that improves stuff like structures and dungeons. I think the biggest problem is that players don't always obey things like locked doors, which makes it very difficult to structure a dungeon like an experience in Minecraft Dungeons where you can't modify the terrain and you have to play it a certain way. And building stuff out of unbreakable blocks that you're going to encounter in the overworld is always a little bit iffy. Um, but locked chests could be a really neat concept. And there is a way in Java Edition, at least, where chests can be locked by using commands. You can set a lock tag using the, uh, the slash data command. I'm reading this from the Minecraft wiki, so this is not a feature I use all that often. But um, basically, you can rename an item something like chest key for example and then if you are holding that item in your inventory or maybe even in your hand when you access the chest that's the only way you can open it and if you don't have that item in your inventory then you're not able to access the chest what if we had that but implemented through a means like a key golem where you have to have a specific mob that you've yeah like thrown on your back or something like that and, and or you're just like dragging it around with you holding it in one hand even maybe on a lead i don't know there are different ways that you could implement it but i like the idea of there being some inventory that you could only access if you had a key golem nearby and then that could lead to a lot of interesting fun game modes and mini games where in order to get the loot out of a structure you have to track down the key golem first the way you do in minecraft dungeons you also have the issue of like what happens if a key golem dies are they invincible are they like a lays where they can heal really easily and you know does the chest then self-destruct if one of them gets killed or something there's there's some really interesting opportunities there i think i think a key golem would probably be something that you should be able to make similar mm. to the copper golem you know like a little yeah. mechanical like steampunky type thing and i kind of think that one of the implementations could be a new redstone piece like a a lock block you know and it only opens when the key golem sticks its head in and and turns around uh and maybe that's not just like a, a lock unlock maybe like it's like an activation thing so like thinking i mean we might be encroaching a little bit on on create that redstone mod that people really like about like mm -hmm. gears and and belts and things but if you can imagine a redstone door or a redstone contraption or a redstone mini game where both you and your partner have to have key golems with you and then you both have to like you know it's that thing where you both have to put the key in and turn it at the same time yeah, in, order, yeah. in order to progress like that kind of thing could be could be cool like you know you have to if you're doing a race like you're doing a foot race a little obstacle course and the only way that you can complete that race and log your score and then proceed to the next level is if you both get to the end at the same time uh, and turn your keys that kind of stuff could be could be quite fun and then that block itself could be used for other things redstone components you get people that are in redstone having a thing if it's a cool looking block it could be used decoratively that kind of thing um i think it may be look looking making making it look different than just like a dropper you know it have to maybe have a little bit more of a decorative look to it but that, i think that could be fun i think that could be an interesting way to kind of like lock and unlock certain things. And I see more of a mini game implementation and imaginary implementation than any kind of real roadblock in the game. Yeah. Um, but I like the inventory thing. I didn't know that about locking chests with, with codes. Yeah, it's something that doesn't really get used all that often because again, it requires creative access. So it's the thing that mm. gets used for, for map making more often than not. But right. the, the mechanic is there and there is precedent for it, which is one of my favorite things when discussing these ideas. It's like, does this sort of exist in minecraft already or is is it completely out of left field or is there maybe a justification based on the features we already have well speaking of things you might want to lock away in a chest uh squeaklefent fantastic username uh writes in with a question about rare blocks joel and johnny i was listening to an earlier episode and someone said they enjoyed the rarity of some blocks like crying obsidian and gilded blackstone i was wondering if mojang did an update to the end for 1.20 uh, if they could add more blocks like these, the defined endstone bricks, for example. What are your thoughts? Squeaklefint tried to swim in lava while trying to find gilded blackstone. That doesn't end well most <laughs> of the time. Yes, I mean, you, uh, you won't find it swimming in lava a lot of the time unless yeah. your, your bastions are uh, tragically 
like I, I don't know waterlogged lava logged whatever you'd call it out there in the yeah. uh, the big lakes so while I think an end update is unlikely, given what we've heard about a more digestible, more attainable update uh, cycle for Minecraft, at least this time around, um, I do like the idea of other rare or non-renewable blocks in the game, but it's always a delicate process from what I've learned over you know talking about Minecraft with you for like four years. Mm -hmm. uh, players want to be able to get more of cool looking blocks. So rare blocks, if they're cool looking and very buildable, then they're, they just people just complain that they can't get enough of them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So they so the cool blocks like this tend to be very specific, like Crying Obsidian and the Gilded Blackstone examples. You're not necessarily going to build a wall of Gilded Blackstone. You're, it's going to be a little bit overkill. So it looks more like an individual special decorative thing, the kind of one block that you'd have above a door, you know, or Crying Obsidian would be used in a very specific case. It's not going to necessarily lend itself to like house building, for example. Um the kind of rare blocks I like that have been added to the game are things like netherite, something that is visually interesting. It's also consumable, has a purpose, and feels like progress. And so I could see them adding more things like that. I don't know what they would do. I don't think we're going to get like another level of mining ability above netherite. It's more like something like that, something that levels up your elytra, something that levels up your speed or your armor or... Uh, I mean, armor was netherite, but like something that might level up enchantments or something along those lines. I feel like those are the things that interest me. And I often wonder whether Mojang thinks about trying to add blocks to the game that are rare like this that would work as a currency in multiplayer situations. Uh, diamonds feel redundant to me at this point. I just feel, and it could be just because like the people that I watch on on YouTube Let's Plays are like power players. Like they do this as a job. So like they always have hundreds of diamonds. There's just, the, ex the amount of diamonds flying around in Hermitcraft just seems silly, you know? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and even to the point where like they've had to create some RP this season to, to balance it out, you know? Uh, and I'm, I'm just, it's weirdly difficult because how how difficult netherite is to get, you would expect it to then take over as like, well, this is more valuable than diamond. Neither are, are renewable. One is a lot harder to get than the other. But I think maybe netherite is so difficult to find and that's why it's not used as a currency because you can't get enough of it to get into circulation where you're like, okay, you know, like, a netherite ingot it's like that's like what four netherite scraps something like that yeah and but so by the time you have all your netherite you've got six right so you've got you can trade with six different people if they're going to price everything the same with one netherite ingot mm -hmm. so I, I feel like that kind of hamstrung the whole netherite taking over as like the most valuable item so i kind of wonder whether there's something that they could do with rare blocks that would make them uh, something that would be more valuable. But, I mean, you can get Crying Obsidian from Piglin Bartering, right? Yes, you can, yeah. yeah. Gilded Blackstone, not so much, though. And, mm -hmm. and balancing blocks like this is difficult. And as a result, I find they tend to be pretty niche for building with. Like, you think about Crying Obsidian and Gilded Blackstone, you said you're not going to build a wall out of them. They are very detailed blocks. Um, and that's why you don't tend to build walls out of them, typically, is because they tend to look over-detailed. Like, there's... Even using the other blackstone textures in with gilded blackstone, it still feels like there's a lot going on. So I find that, yeah, I, I tend to use these kind of blocks pretty sparingly. I like their existence, though. I do think they're they're pretty fun. And I'm not sure quite how that would map onto the end, because a lot of the end has very washed out kind of colors. Like you look at purple blocks, they're not super saturated purple. They're ten they they're they're more like a, a watercolor kind of purple. Yep. The same goes for stuff like endstone. It's very pale, um, almost sickly looking. And I think there's maybe room for a broader color palette to arrive in the end with a full update, but I don't know what that looks like yet. If it looks like it does in Minecraft Dungeons, there's a whole variety of colours to pick from. And there's some really interesting options there, but I'm not certain what the the rare collectible side of that really looks like. A lot of the time, those are linked to specific types of resources, like gilded blackstone can be broken down into gold nuggets. Most of the time when you mine it, you just get the block, even without silk touch, but there is a chance of it breaking down into gold nuggets. But then with there being limited amounts of you know, acquirable resources out in the end, there aren't any ores out in the end right now, 
I'm not sure what that kind of thing would be. And if it turns out to be something that's relatively rare, like emerald ore, for example, I tend to just collect the block to own it, and then I don't tend to do much with it after that. I tend to very occasionally build with it, but there's not a great deal of other utility there. In any other game when there's been a rare item that I've played, uh, I think the best example would be World of Warcraft. That weapon or shield or item would have some sort of player benefit. And that mm -hmm. is why it would be so expensive on the auction house, you know, or you'd have to grind through some dungeon to get it on your own. And I think that that is where, you know, the the valuable aspect of these things lie. It's like it's the difficulty to attain and it's not something that you can just get a ton of very easily, like by AFK or whatever. And I'm with you on things like the Emerald Ore. Like I, I tend to collect a lot of the ores. I, I do it because every once in a while, I just want that one coal ore block to decorate my hearth with because it looks like mm -hmm. soot on the ground. I think, yes, yeah. I'm glad I have several thousands of these for the one that I needed right now. <laughs> it's more of an impulse that I have to collect the coal when I see it um, and kind of an in-joke. But you know, with you, with, you know, uh, emerald ore, same idea. Like just, there's not a lot you can build with it. I mean, unless you're building a pile of emerald ore or, or you're making a jeweler's guild or something. And, and those kind of things, like they don't have any real benefit to the player with the exception of consuming emeralds, but you don't want to do that because then you've destroyed, you've destroyed the block. Um, I kind of wonder if they were to add some sort of block to the game that could change color. I mean, we've got things like, um, prismarine uh and now skulk has an animation there's also redstone lamps that turn on and off when they're powered by redstone i think it would be kind of neat if there was a block that was like say something from the end which it would make the sense that it would be a weird thing from the end dimension but like maybe it's a purple block when it's unpowered and if you turn it on it turns green or it turns blue or mm. something like that if it, if it receives a redstone signal from behind or from anywhere it just changes color doesn't do anything just changes color but that would be cool like that would have some real appeal to a lot of different players, I think, depending on what you're doing with it. And and that could be a, a valuable rare block that does something as opposed to just kind of sit there and go like, well, this is hard to find. And that's the end of the discussion, yeah. right? Th think of the traffic light systems we could make. <laughs> think oh, of the, yes. Being able to have colored lights that blink on and off and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So th there's there's potential for all kinds of stuff. And that's the thing. The, the field is wide open, especially when it comes to the end. But it's, uh, it's inevitable that more rare blocks are coming to the game sooner or later. It's just about what they what they do besides being rare. That's really the, the interesting part. Uh, the third email we have today comes in from GabT. Uh, I say it that way because it's in all caps. Um, they are a new landscape artist member of our Discord, so thank you so much for joining up. And the subject is a mountain rope kit. Hello, gentlemen. This email is not associated with a specific episode, but while playing Bedrock on the Xbox, I recently found myself frowning a bit at always having to pillar up out of caves. What are your thoughts on the addition of a type of spelunking tool slash kit to be able to safely lower and raise oneself into and out of a ravine, a cave, off a cliff, etc.? With the relatively recent Caves and Cliffs update, I think this item would be a nice fit. This would be most useful in the early game, perhaps the item could be associated with a new villager occupation like a mountaineer, a sherpa, or something similar. If not a villager occupation, I'd imagine the resources needed to craft such an item would need to be hefty, since the amount of work it would likely save. Something like a full stack of string could yield a length of mountain rope. Also, this mountain rope could only be anchored onto a specific strong or sturdy block to hold the weight of a player. I'm not sure beyond that, but I know I would like to not have to place alien pillars in beautiful huge chasms simply as a means to exit. Thoughts? I, I love the idea of of a rope in minecraft in all kinds of ways uh i think that i forget sometimes having a five-year-old world with elytra for most of that that a lot of players end up resetting often mm -hmm. and that means that you are having to find your own way in and out of these now massive caves that have been uh naturally generating in the world that you can't just double tap and fly out of a giant cave right and uh, the idea of a rope mechanic, especially if you compare it to how scaffolding works. And if we could have a rope where if you put the rope on the bottom of a block and you continue to add rope to it, it would just continue down, allowing you to then climb down or climb back up. And if there was a way, unlike scaffolding, where it just kind of barfs everywhere when you're done with it, if you could then pull the rope back up. So like if you mine the rope, you get 
a piece of rope, but you're essentially kind of like taking it up from the bottom as if you're spooling the rope rope back up. And I think that could be an interesting mechanic, especially if they allow the rope to then be placed like a decorative block and use it like a chain in the same way that those are being able to be placed uh, vertically, horizontally in the game. Because then you could add all kinds of decorative function to the game, to, to, to the block. You could add, you know, it would have a function of going up and down, but you could then have things look like they're suspended. You could have things look like they're being held in place. You could have things look like they're being tethered horizontally. There's all kinds of really cool stuff that we could do with a rope uh, in the game. I think a stack of string is maybe a little bit hefty. I think it would be more interesting to combine it with something like string and wheat, wool, bamboo, maybe kind of like a scaffolding tie-in. Any mm -hmm. kind of fiber in the game that you could combine with string uh, to make to make rope. But uh, I like the idea. What do you think? I've played mod packs that introduce climbing ropes like this as a mechanic before. You effectively have something like a ladder that you can raise and lower. And I find that the same problem occurs that occurs with stuff like vines, where it's very easy to fall off, and it's kind of potentially difficult to control because if you're standing in that space, you're kind of moving forwards, backwards, left and right. You can right. strafe side to side, yeah. and it's difficult to approach it like climbing in the same way that, like, you know, if, if, you're, if you've got a ladder that's straight down, the, bl the ladder has to be attached to a block, so you've always got one block that you can kind of push against, and if you push forward, mm -hmm. you're going up. But then if you've got a rope, are you holding jump? Like, the control scheme has to be considered. The other thing about using ropes in... I think it's Sky Factory is probably the pack that I've played that included them. They were made out of fiber that you got from sifting the very earliest materials that you ended up getting. Like, you know, you could break sand down into dust, and then if you had, like little bits of fiber in the dust you could weave those together into a rope and the reason you did this was it was all because you get a water bucket before you have the ability to move water around using an iron bucket and once you have that you basically use the water bucket for all of your vertical traversal because water buckets are very overpowered in minecraft just right. having the ability to use those to get out of a cave i find is preferable to me than pillaring up a lot of the time. And you can even use them to traverse along the top of a cave if you are quick on the draw, because you can climb a wall with one of them just by placing it above you and then retracting the water into the bucket, place it a few blocks higher up and keep repeating that. But then as you go out onto the ceiling, you can find places on the ceiling to place the water bucket, and then you have a water column to rise up that's out in the middle of the room by that point. So... Water buckets are really my answer to why isn't there a grappling hook in Minecraft? Why isn't there this or that? And water buckets also have the safety feature of giving you water pooling at the bottom of the water column that you can fall into in the event that you step out and, and you know, you travel too far away, you can't catch yourself in time. The only problem with using a water bucket, though, is that it tends to sweep away any torches, any natural cave features, grass, if you're in a lush cave, you know, skulk blocks, whatever. Like, it, it tends to affect the environment around you because the water spills out everywhere. So I can see there being a downside to that that maybe merits some other kind of feature that works in a similar way. Speaking of, you can do this with weeping vines too, right? Like, you can bring... Yes, that's... Yeah. Uh, one of my other points here was consider bringing weeping vines from the nether obviously if we're talking early game then maybe you haven't been to the nether yet you can't find the biome that has the the weeping vines which is you know specifically the crimson forest and uh, if you're like me you spawn into a crimson forest basically every time but sometimes it doesn't work <laughs> out that way a lot of people end up getting basalt deltas so uh yeah i think weeping vines are an option you can bone meal them unlike other types of vines so it's easy for them to grow but the same restrictions apply right because once you get to the ceiling of whatever cavern that you are you know pillaring down from you're sort of stuck there unless you've got something that you can bridge out to or if you've placed the vines up there to begin with like that's something you've got to plan ahead for and then you you are left with vines being there permanently unless you take them down i still think stuff like ropes has a place in the game aesthetically because the technology that the player is working with and i like the idea of seeing a rope anchored to some kind of hefty rock in a cave that kind of indicates oh a player was here but it's still a subtle thing it can still kind of blend in a little bit in the same way that you could do something aesthetically similar with a line of fences just a vertical pillar of fence posts going down into the darkness and maybe cutting off at a certain point 
but you can you can kind of emulate that. It doesn't have the functionality though. And so finding a rope kind of analog in Minecraft is probably something like a fence post but with extra functionality. I yeah, the thing that grabs me about ropes is like the ability to put things horizontally. Like you could tie things together like wagons and you could um you could have them along the railings that you don't you know like a wall seems too much a chain doesn't maybe fit but a rope would just be great you know like i feel like that kind of stuff would be would be cool i like the idea of also having the rope be something similar to how we could put like glow lichen or skulk veins on blocks and that adds a whole range of different decorative ideas because every block can have one of these little like layers on top of it yeah. If you could do something similar to how when a lead is wrapped around a fence post, you know how it has that like wrapping yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, model to it. If you could do that with a rope, if you could wrap a rope around any block in the game, similar to putting a trap door on it, similar to, you know, putting a button on it, it would just add that next level of like, this is something that I can add to every block in the game by adding one item. And then it would change. You could change the potential look of, of almost everything. Mm -hmm. you know? I think that's yeah. an interesting application, right? Yeah, and, and again, has precedent in what we've already seen already. Although, if you're yeah. applying rope around a block and then the rope is climbable, what you've done is reinvent the ladder. So again, there's <laughs> there's mechanics like that that exist again already, and it's whether we need another one of those and how often stuff like that is going to be useful in the early game versus late game. It's it's an interesting challenge, but yeah, I do think there's there's room for it in Minecraft, depending on which direction things go in future. Final email comes from a skulk of foxes, and the subject is keybinds. Hello, Pix and Joel. I originally bought Minecraft on my son's Nintendo Switch, since that's what he plays everything on. But after watching many, many YouTube videos and Twitch streams of people playing Java Edition, I decided I wanted to play on my PC instead so I could take advantage of the really cool data and resource packs that weren't available on Bedrock. However, I have always been a console player and figuring out how to control my character with a keyboard and mouse has been a major challenge. I don't really like the default keybinds. Uh, I would like to customize it to make it feel more natural to me. I know there are mods that allow you to use a controller, but I would really like to learn to play with a mouse and keyboard. What are your preferred keybinds? Do you use the defaults or do you customize them? Thank you for your wonderful podcast and your streams. I've learned so much and truly can't get enough. All a skulk of foxes fell into a ravine because he was looking down at his keyboard instead of watching where he was going. Yep, it happens to the best of us. Um, also, yep. this is this is me being reminded that a skulk is the collective noun for a group of foxes. Uh, that's mm -hmm. very appropriate for the ones that lurk in my backyard every day. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so keybinds. That I was never really a PC gamer when i got into minecraft either i had played pc games before i played a bit of starcraft and and warcraft and stuff like that but those are all fairly mouse heavy games like a lot of the interaction and even stuff like before that like point and click adventure games and stuff there wasn't a huge amount of emphasis on controlling your characters using the keyboard unless in the cases of stuff like warcraft and starcraft you were very good at the game <laughs> and you had all of the macros and stuff set up so um yeah when i got into playing minecraft on pc eight years ago now i was not really a pc wasd gamer either and it felt weird to me at first and i adapted fairly quickly but it did still feel strange for the first little while now i have the opposite problem now if i go back to play minecraft on xbox i have no idea what i'm doing mm. so i get a, bit, a little bit of the the fumble fingers thing but the majority of what i've done has been with the default keybinds i realize because i just got used to them and I can imagine people who are used to other PC games with different control systems rebinding things so that, say, the sprint key and the sneak key are swapped around because they're more used to running with shift than they are with control, for example. There's, there's a few things like that that I know people change. The only thing I've changed from the default keybinds is rebinding the F5 key, which changes your perspective, to the R key so that it's closer to WASD and I can tap it without having to move my entire hand or bring my mouse hand over to hit F5. Like, I, it's a bit of a reach for me from WASD. And I like to change my perspective in games so that I can see some stuff around me or so that I can flip things around and be like I'm talking to the camera while I'm making a video. But that's all I've done is switch the, the button that gives you third-person perspective instead of first-person. So... 
I've moved a couple of the default keys. I come to Minecraft having spent a fair amount of time playing first person shooters before Minecraft. So WASD for moving around was pretty natural for me. Um, what I was missing was that in a lot of those games, the first person shooters, Q and E were kind of like diagonal strafing. Like, so you could do kind of like a, a, a walking at an angle. Um, but in Minecraft, Q was the drop key. And so I moved it because I was constantly pressing it by accident just because it's so close to WASD. So I moved the drop key over to V and uh, that is what I use to drop items. Uh, Shift V for dropping a lot of items, like all that kind of stuff. Um, but then WASD, I never had a much of a chance to, or a, a difficult time getting used to. Uh, I'm one of those players and this includes my first person playthroughs. I don't use one, two, three, four, five to change things in my hotbar. Never have. I use the mouse wheel and... I know a lot of people that come from first person shooters, though really good players tend to use their keys to switch to weapons. And I just have never been able to get used to it in Minecraft. So I just use the mouse wheel. You have to have a good mouse, make sure that your wheel is accurate, stuff like that. But I find that's the most, you know, easiest way to move things around on the hotbars, just using the mouse wheel. Um, I started playing on a Mac and the sprint key on a Mac, I believe was for me, command. And on a Windows keyboard, that's left alt, not control. Control is way over on on the the left hand side under shift. So I use shift like every other player does. Um, I I use it for you know sneaking and crouching and stuff. But my sprint key is alt because it's right next to the space bar. I can hit it with my thumb mm -hmm. super easily. Uh, and then the only other keys I have, these are more for um, some of the data packs and some of the the things that that. Uh, Skulka Foxes is talking about. I use my C key for zoom in. I think that's just the default for Optifine from years ago. Yeah. And so that that tends to be the whatever mod I'm using right now. I can't remember which fabric mod I have, but it's not Optifine. Is and, logical I, zoom maybe? I think we use uh, that on, on Empires. So yeah. It's the logical zoom. Or there's another one. There was one called Zoomify. There was one called OK Zoomer that doesn't work anymore. OK Zoomer was really good, but it just it doesn't it didn't move forward with the other things. I have to update a bunch of stuff. We have to update to 119.2 on the Citadel yet and. Mm -hmm. We were looking to go through and figure out what you know what mods are are up to date and which if we want to switch to one that has more control. Um, so I use the C key for that, and then I have the zeros mini map, and I just use M. But like when I'm using the map, it's not something I have to functionally do while I'm like running away from a mob. So like taking my hand off of WASD and going M is not a big deal, you know, because I'm I'm generally standing and talking to do you know, Twitch stream about something. Um, but yeah, I don't use much much for the keyboard now in terms of your f5 i use the f3 key a lot but i have it bound to my thumb button on my mouse right so okay. again i so i don't have to constantly be leaving the wast space to hit f3 because i end up taking screenshots by accident by hitting f2 or i hit f4 and it changes my camera slow like there's i i always miss the key um however on the minimap uh mod that i run I have the, the coordinates underneath the map on screen as well as the time of day. The time of day just helps me sleep through the night fast enough so I'm not dealing with dark and can't see what I'm doing. But I always forget that the Y coordinates are there. You know, they're a little smaller, but they're there and they're even easier to discern. And yet I always hit F3 on my, like my thumb button on my on my mouse to kind of get there and and look at the big wash of data that comes on the mm -hmm. F3 screen. Yeah. Um, just because it's second nature, right? Uh, and then the other thing, I don't use it very often because I'm not one of those streamers or players that like flips the camera around at my player to like address. And it's more of a YouTube thing, I think. But for a while there, when I wanted to take screenshots or do things like that, when I was doing edited YouTube content, I had a macro attached to one of the buttons on the top of the mouse and it would like double press the F5. So I would go straight into the correct um facing the ca the camera facing the player mm -hmm. and then a single press of some other button would take me back out and so sometimes if you've got access to macros you might find that that will help you if you've got some things that are complicated in in the process but i i experienced the same thing when i tried to play bedrock on xbox uh i found that my biggest hang up was not so much the inventory it was how slow it was to move the cursor around uh looking around was fine but moving things in my inventory was just painful like i mm -hmm. just i'm so used to it being so much faster in in minecraft on java edition with a mouse and keyboard 
that I just, I, I couldn't really do much. I didn't feel like building anything big because it was like, this would just take forever. And, and I just can't, I mean, I'd struggle with the inventory now in on Java with all the different blocks that I want to use. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If I can take the opportunity to promote my survival guide series, um, there's oh, a, absolutely. there's an early video in that series. It's before the like regular numbered episodes even got started. I did four episodes that are about general stuff that we would kind of take for granted that people understood about minecraft before we got into the actual gameplay so the second episode of that is all about keyboard controls and keyboard shortcuts and stuff like that and so maybe that will be helpful uh, a skulker foxes says they're having trouble controlling the character so i assume movement is the main issue and maybe it's about like understanding that the mouse is what controls your perspective and it's the direction that you're looking at and then sometimes the thing that I find a little odd is the way Minecraft shifts between different styles of movement. For example, if you are just walking around on land, that's totally fine. If you're looking up, you're not going to be going up when you're walking around. And the same is true of if you're flying around in creative mode. But then when you start swimming, suddenly the direction you're traveling is controlled by the player's perspective because you're moving in 3D space instead of, you know, on a flat plane. So suddenly that comes into play and you're moving forward with W, but forward can also be up or down as well as straight in front of you. So so there's a few things to work out there. But yeah, hopefully if you want to check that video out, it might help to clarify some things. But really, if you're going from console to keyboard and you've never really been a PC gamer or played the kind of games where you control stuff like this, it is just going to be an adjustment period. I don't know if I could recommend any superior keybind setups, but I'm sure there are other people out there who have had other experiences with Minecraft and want to, you know, suggest an alternative control scheme. So yeah. maybe we're not the people to ask, but good luck on your search. I'm sure there will be some folks out there who've got some better ideas for you. One last tip, it's less of a keybind thing, but something you can do to try to get used to WASD is if you press A and W or W and D at the same time, you will kind of travel off at an angle. And something you can do is give yourself like a, a good space, like a big kind of like area of 20 or 30 blocks clear in, in either direction and put a couple of blocks in the middle and try to walk around them, but try to look at them the entire time you're walking around them. I do this all the time when I'm walking through West Hill and I don't even think about it. Like I'm walking down the street and I turn to look at a building and talk to the audience about it, but I continue to walk forward. It's similar to like walking down a sidewalk and then looking at something in the street, but you're still walking. You're just not looking where you're going. And that to me is one of the held over skills from the first person shooter where you're wanting to strafe and move, but you have to keep the bad guy in your sights. You don't want to take your eye off them because that ends up bad. Uh, and, and I find that it's a skill in Minecraft that I, I sometimes take for granted. Like I'm often pressing keys and moving my character in a different direction than I'm looking. So if you can practice that, you'll get kind of like a spatial awareness of like what's happening. Um, unless of course you are wearing a light tread near water. That is not you. That is the game. <laughs> that is the game's fault. That is not you. Shots fired. All right, uh, we're going to wrap things up there before this gets too controversial. Uh, thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Spawn Chunks, folks. Uh, you can find more information about the show and links to some of the stuff that we've talked about today at thespawnchunks.com. The music for the show was composed by me, and The Spawn Chunks is proud to be a listener-supported podcast. If you're getting some value out of the show, why not consider putting some value back in? You can do that at patreon.com slash thespawnchunks to join our community. Pledging at any level gets you an invite to our patrons-only Discord chat. You can listen to the show live as it's recorded in discord every week you also get to hang out with us on the monthly minecraft audio hangout where people share their builds and we talk about trends in the minecraft community and what our patrons have been up to it's one of the highlights of the month these days we currently have 335 patrons which is up two from last week so thanks to the two of you who jumped on board and one of them even sent an email look at that uh, a special thanks of course as always go out to our content engineers hunter 555 jumbo sale and yitz thank you for your support on this episode Sharing the podcast with your friends is the easiest way to support the show. You can find us at The Spawn Chunks on Twitter and Instagram. Personal recommendations are by far the best way to share the podcast. Just tell a friend about The Spawn Chunks and where they can go to listen. That includes iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and even YouTube. You can email the show at spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. The RSS feed is linked on the spawnchunks.com and the patron-only RSS feed 
is on the Patreon page. That's where you can listen to the Render Distance, the extended version of the podcast. My name is Johnny, but online I go by Pixlriffs. You can find most of what I do at youtube.com slash Pixlriffs, where I try to make sense of this bizarre and wonderful game in Season 2 of both the Minecraft Survival Guide and Empire's SMP. I stream three days a week on Twitch, where I do behind-the-scenes work for the aforementioned YouTube series, and I'm also the voice of the unofficial Hermitcraft recap, which you can find through a quick YouTube search. Aside from that, I'm at Pixlriffs on both Twitter and Instagram. Joel, where can people find you online? Everything I'm doing online, including my illustration and design portfolio, is at joelduggan.com. The Citadel Cafe is my podcast about sci-fi and fantasy entertainment. And this week, Johnny is going to be joining me, and we're going to be talking about The Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, episodes 1, 2, and 3. Lots of spoilers. Make sure you've watched them, but that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. You can follow me at Joel Duggan on social media and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I stream a few times a week now. Uh, a lot of the weekday streams are satisfactory, and Fridays our lego and right now i'm building the lego optimus prime thanks for visiting the spawn chunks the world outside is infinite and it's deeper than you think